Hi, this is Eric Cressy, and today we've got a little lesson uh, on the continuum of athletic development. Um, some people call it the static spring continuum. Um, I refer to it as the continuum between absolute speed and absolute strength. And you can really apply it to just about any sport, and we'll certainly look at it in a general sense as we start off. Um, and, and from there, I'll actually apply it a little bit more to what's really in my niche, um, which is developing baseball players. So um, if you really think about it, the, probably the best way to start looking at this is to think about how you would build an elite sprinter. If you think about what an elite sprinter does, really in their training, you know, you're going to start out, you're going to have some kind of heavy lifting, whether it's squats, deadlifts, um, so absolute strength stuff that's emphasized, uh, a low speed of lifting with a high amount of load. Um, whereas you can go right on and go to speed, uh, strength speed, which would be more along the lines of Olympic lifts. So uh, a weight moved quickly at, at still a relatively high percentage of your one rep max. Speed strength, more of your classic jump squats, things along those lines, work with weight vests. Um, and then absolute speed, obviously, for, a, for an elite sprinter would be more on the lines of just what they would do with their plyos or their, you know, their regular sprint training. Um, and certainly that's you know, something that we can carry over to other sports as well and, and really appreciate how we develop athletic talent. If you think about why so many high school athletes respond tremendously well to a strength conditioning program, it's largely because they've spent so much time at this end of the continuum that just by moving all the way to the other end of the spectrum, they get to a point where they can make the most um, out of all of these different components and, and eventually derive benefits from Olympic lifts and, and certain plyometric training and obviously resistance training. So the ideal is to bring somebody a little bit more central on this and, and teach them to use a little bit of everything. Uh, and certainly there are going to be people that are going to be more geared towards being at one end of the spectrum. If we get a power lifter in here who's used to just lifting really heavy stuff slowly and he all of a sudden wants to become an athlete, it makes sense that I'm going to bring him all the way over to the absolute speed end of the continuum and do more sprint stuff, more uh, you know, low load, high velocity training. Um, but by that same token, you got to remember that you have a lot of young athletes, you know, basketball players I've worked with who are a great example. They spend hours and hours and hours on the court jumping, sprinting, and all they're doing is this absolute speed stuff. And all of a sudden, you introduce an absolute strength benefit, and they get a lot more out of it, especially since we know that strength is a, is a big foundation for power. So you can max out your power improvements um, if you're not making a conscious effort to increase strength at the same time. So I think one of the questions is, you know, how do I apply this in the context of what we do with our baseball players and in particular pitchers? Well, what I can tell you is we know that our young players respond incredibly well to strength conditioning because they spent their entire life basically on the absolute speed end of the kin syndrome, which is basically throwing a five-ounce baseball. Okay, so whether it's long toss, bullpens, flat ground sessions, or just playing catch, whatever it may be, they've spent their entire career at this end of the spectrum. Um, the problem is most players stop there. They don't understand that strength conditioning can actually do a lot for them because they worry they're going to get tight, um, which is really only the case with an inappropriately designed strength conditioning program. Um, in reality, we can get a huge benefit out of bringing them all the way over to the end of the continuum. So if we're talking about just our regular strength training, they can actually do a lot to kind of keep that continuum going all the way to the end of the spectrum. But by that same token, there's even more that we can do to kind of fill in the cracks. If you think about what we're doing in terms of strength speed, for this population, that might be our medicine ball training. And I've written about it in the past on this, on this website, and that's that we think a lot of weighted balls. There's actually a lot of merit and a lot of research support in their use in the right population. So you can fill in that speed strength part of the continuum with weighted balls, and eventually you see that a complete de baseball development uh, program is going to borrow bits and pieces from all of these, and they're certainly going to have to come at the right times of year. And, and if you really think about how players become better, um, think about why college players tend to do better than, than kids who are drafted right out of high school when they go to the pros, what's the difference between that population? We know a college player has gotten a strength and conditioning experience for at least three years in many cases. Um, we know that more college coaches are probably open mind to the idea of using medicine balls and weighted balls. So what we've done is we've given them several years of development to get away from just what they've been doing here and bring them over a little bit further. And obviously this continuum goes from specificity over here to a more general training style over here. But let's also think about that in the context of what we see in professional baseball players, uh, particularly if you look at pitchers who may see velocity decreases over the course of their career. Um, we know that as a general rule of thumb in males, and you know, it depends on who you ask, people are going to peak in strength around age 29. And certainly that's you know, open to determination on you know, when people start training and all that. But if you think about what it really means is, if I have less strength here, 
I'm going to be a shift a little bit further over here, and, and it, it does make sense that I would lose a little bit on that entire velocity equation. Um, and it's even more significant because if you think about it, if we're dealing with pitchers who have been around a little bit longer, those are the ones that are a lot more mechanically efficient. So you can have mastered your mechanics, but at the same time, if you let your, uh, your, your strength go down and your whole body, uh, I guess, you know, preparedness go down, you're going to be in trouble. So effectively, they've lost part of this equation. But for a pitcher who's 27, 28, 29, 30, who's starting to see that velocity change, just a simple change in, in training style can really benefit them. Um, but what's you know, even more interesting is seeing some of these younger pitchers who have this big window of adaptation in front of them just by taking advantage of some of these other options. Some have just been here and here and need to do more work in this area. You know, some people you know, may have just made themselves too tight with a bad resistance training program, and they need to do more on the light end of things. Uh, but, you know, beyond just that, you have to realize that strength and speed actually are very much interrelated. Um, you know, reactive ability is a big, you know, important part of how you throw a baseball hard. You need to be able to efficiently make use of that stretch shortening cycle. And if you're over here and you're someone who's blessed with a lot of natural reactive ability, that can lead to some, some, some you know, obviously great velocity improvements, but at the same time, it can subject you um, to being a little bit more erratic if your strength drops over the course of a season. And as you get more and more fatigued throughout a game where you can rely less and less on that stretch shortening cycle, you're going to get into trouble. Um, but it also has a little bit, you know, uh, of an implication in the context of what we deal with with players who may have congenital laxity. You know, we always talk about, you know, you have to pick a right resistance training program so that you don't change around um, the flexibility that we see in the shoulder. Um, but we also have a, a big chunk of the professional baseball population, and obviously more down in the amateur ranks as well, who were born with congenital laxity. So they have this joint hypermobility. And when you think about someone like that, they don't need to stretch. They have all the range of motion they need, and it's not really going anywhere. But what they do need is a tremendous amount of, of stability. And what you're going to see, these congenital laxity folks who are just the short, you know, re, you know, not so much short, but they're the very reactive, Gumby-like people who can contort their bodies all over the place and just jump through the roof, they're the ones that are relying very heavily on that absolute speed end of the continuum. But it becomes a big problem because if you have congenital laxity and are just very reactive, you let your strength go down, especially as you age, those velocity decreases are going to come very, very quickly. And beyond that, you're not going to be able to stabilize joints nearly as well. So it's not uncommon for, to see these players who have congenital laxity run into problems as their career goes on because they aren't efficiently stabilizing those joints and making use of that stretch shortening cycle because they just don't have the strength to really make it work anymore. And of course, that's dependent on cross-sectional area, we already know, but it's also dependent on, on neural adaptations that we get with strength training. So um, that speaks a little bit to what we're, you know, we're doing in terms of how we develop our athletes. Um, and you know, more than anything, I hope that you can look at this kind of chart that we built up here, and you can see that you, know, you may be in one point on the continuum more so than another, and you find those windows of adaptation wherever you can get them.